So I had that recurring income and I had the flexibility fundamentally. I just didn't want somebody telling me what to do. <laughs> I think that's fair enough though, isn't it? Would you say you have a successful business now that you were hoping for? Yes, yes, I think I do. In terms of the training then with It's Easy, what was that actually like? Mind-blowing. So, Susie Perry, welcome to The Disenfranchised. How are you doing today? I'm very well, thank you, Ed. And what about yourself? Yes, I'm very good. Thank you very much. Um... Although I'm, I'm sad that we've just had last night the first bit of rain that I've had for a long time. Like, I've not seen rain for a month or two, it feels like. So uh, that's it. Winter's approaching very oh, soon. But The gardeners uh, will be happy, though. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I've just had artificial grass put in, though, so <laughs> it doesn't really bother me. I've had green grass oh, for, for, for ages. Well, those yeah. are going to be happy. <laughs> yeah exactly exactly but um uh enough, enough about the weather i guess and um, yes. let's, let's jump straight into your um your career and try and find out um or I, i'm interested to find out what was your first job oh goodness um i i think if we um skim past things like fish and chip shops and saturday jobs um my first professional job after i graduated was at um icl who were a, okay. a large it company in the uk um they, they don't exist anymore they were bought up by fujitsu but um yes i went in as a graduate into a large it company Right. Okay. So you say as a, a graduate, so you was at university. What did you study at the uni? So I did maths at university. Maths. Okay. Yeah. That's not an, an easy um, <laughs> task to undertake. So you've, you've definitely got some, um, some brains behind you then and going into the IT world, probably at, at, what year was that in, in the IT world? Oh goodness. Uh, so I graduated in 1992. Okay. Many yeah. Years so, but, ago. The, re the reason I ask is that's, that was a good time to get into the IT industry, right? Um, Theoretically, but actually I didn't like it. It was way too corporate for me. Um, and it was all very much um, sort of black suits and clipboards. And it was, uh, I felt like with me, it was like trying to stick around peg into a square hole. Um, and I actually decided to leave after a year because I okay. wasn't enjoying it very much. Um, and I actually uh, then went and trained to be a secondary maths teacher. Okay. So going back to the, 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 the maths side of things. So I went back to the maths side of things, but then within the school that I was in, um, because I enjoyed the IT, I ended up being in charge of the IT within the department um, and started, I mean, you know, this was at the point where, um, you know, maybe every classroom had one computer and there was one computer suite for the entire school. Um, um, we started using those and I really enjoyed integrating IT into the curriculum because a lot of the time it was being taught as a standalone. Um, so you would have an IT lesson rather than teach math through the use of IT. Um, and then actually a few years after that, I then sort of almost went full circle and went back to an IT company, but as an educational consultant. Ah, that's, that's quite cool. Yeah. I, I remember the, um, at my school, yeah, like you say, it was probably 10 computers in a room or 15 computers in a room and everyone sort yeah. of shoved in. You took turns on the computers. And, and and at the end of the lesson, I used to make them all hold a mouse um, so it was facing me so I could see that the little rubber ball was in it and said three, two, one, and they all had to put it down and walk. Otherwise, you had kids wandering around with the little rubber balls through the mice because they were really bouncy. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. But I, talking about maths, I remember in my maths um, lessons, it was all chalkboards and it was those rolling chalkboards. So you, oh, you know, I you grab one of those. <laughs> roll through. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, the fact that you kind of integrating it at that time. So that would have been, yeah, when I was sort of early in secondary school, really. So, um, yeah, so I could have been I, more maths teacher if you'd have been in the right place. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm just, uh, the reason I say it is I think you perhaps a little bit ahead of the times, you know, uh, because, or, or, you know, on the, on the cusp of that change, you know, so you were you're being quite, um, oh, what's the word I'm after? Um, not creative, but you know, you, you're on the cusp of kind of innovation. Yes. That's what I, I'm yes. talking about. Within, on the cusp of innovation. So, so 
you then decided to go back into corporate or were you kind of headhunted? No, um, so I think I had a ba uh, fascination with the back pages of the Times Educational Supplement um, because they used to have the jobs abroad there. And I did think about going abroad at one point, but then I saw an advert um, for uh, RM and they were looking for educational consultants. Um, so I ended up um, applying for that, got the job, and then I was working with teachers in schools again to integrate IT into the curriculum. Um, and that was also around about the time of the NOF funding that the government gave um, to help te train teachers up with IT. So it was a, a very interesting time to have that job. Yeah, sounds quite cool. So um, how, how long were you in that job for? So um, I, oh goodness, I think I was probably in that job for about six or seven years, but the latter end of it also covered two maternity leaves. Um, and then the practicality of being in that job, um, the, the kid's dad used to work evenings um, and I could be in Cornwall one day, Kent the next, Aberdeen the next, and just... It was unsustainable with two small children. Um, so that was when I left that job. Um, and after that, I, I actually um, went into my first franchise. So I thought I, I fancy being um, self-employed. Um, but part of the idea behind being self-employed was being able to do things for myself. And I thought, if I end up setting up a business which takes all of my time, then I'm not doing what I want to do, which is to spend more time with the children. So I thought, right, franchise blueprint for a successful business. So I started looking at some small franchises um, and came up with Images Art Exhibitions, which was actually working in primary schools, helping primary schools do some fundraising raising and um, through the use of artwork uh, sales of their artwork all right that's cool so that was what i then did probably for the next five or six years um really enjoyed that because it was still back in schools um, but i think i got to the point where the kids were towards the end of secondary school sorry not secondary school um mid primary school um and i thought i think i want to be using my brain a bit more so I sold um, the Images Art Exhibitions franchise and started looking for my next franchise. Um, actually, I didn't look for a franchise. What I looked for is I looked at going back into proper, proper work. Um, yeah. I also looked at um, sales of existing companies. Um, I looked at setting something up on my own and I looked at franchises. Um, I realised I really didn't want to go and work for somebody else, which kind of knocked that one out. A lot of the businesses that I looked at, which was then running an existing business, I felt like the, the scope and the capacity to really build them wasn't there. Um, and a lot of them were um, either food and drink businesses that would have meant tying myself to the business the whole time. And again, that wasn't really what I wanted. Um, so... Um, and I thought about, you know, maybe with my maths and IT background, I could then become a website designer, but actually realised I really enjoy speaking to people. So then I started looking at franchises for website design because I thought that can combine the enjoyment of talking to people, which I'd always had with the teaching and the educational consultancy, but it combined it nicely with um, a bit of IT um, and, and hence where I ended up where I am now and yeah I've been here now for 11 and a half years and it's the longest I've held down any job position or role in my life. <laughs> Yeah, that's re that's really cool. But and I've got so many questions to ask off the back of all of that, <laughs> <laughs> and and plenty about being with it's easy. So I'm I'm going to come back to it's easy in a minute. But yeah. um, the, the the first one was you you mentioned you kind of looked at a franchise. Uh, I can't remember what you said it was arts it it or something. art exhibitions, art, arts images and art exhibitions. Um, how did you find? franchises or franchising as an industry was it something you was always aware of or did you just kind of um stumble across it one day i think i had always been aware of it as an in as an industry um and when my daughter was very very young so i mean like a, a couple of months old i booked myself onto um 
uh, a course which was to discover more about franchises and how they worked and get some recommendations. Um, and I remember that she was that young, actually, because my mum popped up at lunchtime with her so I could feed her. So she really was that tiny. Um, and I remember sitting in there thinking, yeah, idea, having a blueprint for a business that actually works. Um, because actually at the time, bearing in mind that I was giving up a fairly well-paid job, the idea of jacking it all in for something that might or might not work, um, I've never been a huge risk taker. I've never enjoyed taking risks. So for me, that was why I went and found out even more, discovered what to look for a bit more. Um, and, and yes, that was why I, I then found... Um, the images franchise off the back of that um, and I think that I must have gone on to franchising websites where lots and lots of franchises were advertised um, and that was why I chose that one yeah was it a big investment at that point in time um yes I suppose it was really for me um but that that franchise was slightly different because you were also investing in stock yeah. Um, because of the, the picture frame. So for me, yes, it was um, a fairly big investment. But I mean, that, that's all relative, isn't it? So for somebody else investing, it might not be that big. But at the time, um, yes, it, it felt like a big investment for me. But if you were looking at somebody who had maybe just retired and had been given, you know, a, a big lump of money to, yes, be retired, but it might not have been that big. But for me at the time, it felt like a small fortune. Yeah, I think it is. Uh, it is for a lot of people that um, leave leave a you know a good job and and are ready to do something different. And, and as you say, invest in a franchise because you've got that kind of blueprint to follow. But it's still still going to feel like a big chunk of money, even if it's three thousand or ten thousand or a hundred thousand, yeah. isn't it? You know. Um, yes, it's a relative, definitely. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But um, it's great. You, you, so it was a success that franchise then, and you you managed to sell it with a bit of profit. I, I you know I don't want you to go into I numbers. Doubles but... my money. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, that's all right then. So um, yes, I did okay. <laughs> so that's good. So how and why did you decide that employment wasn't right for you then? I think I liked the flexibility. Um, so, I mean, it's a double-edged sword. I remember going to exhibitions on days where, um, I remember one particular one where my ex-partner was coming with me and I was actually being so ill that I, I couldn't even really function. And I was thinking, yeah, this is ridiculous. If I had a proper job, I wouldn't be doing this. But do you know what? It was absolutely worth it for all of the nativity plays and the pickups and the other bits and pieces I did. And I love the fact I could put the kids to bed um, and then start working at sort of eight o'clock in the evening. Um, and yeah, I, whilst COVID has produced very different flexible working patterns, at that time, the flexible working patterns for young parents were not really there quite so much. Um, yeah. So for me, yeah, the flexible working was a, a really, really big pro. Um, and I, I think also fundamentally, I just didn't want somebody telling me what to do. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's fair enough, though, isn't it? <laughs> I think there are certain people that, 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 that like to be told, don't they? They like to have a, a clear, this is your task for today or this week or month. Yeah. You know, work towards that. But I think there are a lot of other people that have, are in jobs where they're being told what to do and don't really enjoy it. I think I, I think I was like that. I'd always kind of argue and, and sort of put my point across to try and get out of doing something I didn't want to do, you know? Yes. And, uh, or you thought it was being done wrong, you had no control over it a lot of the yeah, time. Yeah, that, that was perhaps the biggest one for me was the strategy of the leaders. I think the longer you're with a company, the more you kind of start understanding the the kind of hierarchy in their decision making process and when you realize that the person at the top is making decisions that you don't agree with and that further down the line impacts you you do kind of go yeah i can't do this anymore and i, I think yeah, that's absolutely. why a lot of people move but um yeah that's that's cool so did you at any point ever think about setting up your own um you know website design business um and, and kind of what put you off that idea maybe so I did think about it. Um, what put me off that idea? Um, I, I think it was twofold. So um, number one, um, 
I don't think I wanted to take the risk. Um, and I, yes, I, as I said, I've got young kids. I was fairly risk averse. Um, and that was a big reason that I wanted to avoid it. And secondly, actually running my own business, I, I think I thought, well, you know, I'm going to have to really almost retrain in all of the technical side of this. And is that actually what I want to be doing? I knew that I was technical enough to pick up um, a content management system fairly easily. But did I really want to spend my whole time with a computer rather than talking to the people side of it? And yeah, it was working with people, I think, floated my boat more than just doing the IT side of it. But there was a, definitely a lot in it in terms of being risk averse. Yeah, sure. It, I think it makes a lot of sense if you're that that type of person that um, enjoys engaging with people. Um, I, I'm just giving my perspective, you know, in my role now, I, I quite enjoy that side of things. But then I'm also going to go away and do the editing for this podcast, right, which some days I really enjoy. But when it gets deeper and deeper into it, and I'm trying to look at kind of it's editing balance, the... Isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And trying to edit the sound and then trying to find the right piece of music to go with a track, you know, it then becomes a bit tedious for me. And I think, oh, I just wish I could push this to someone else because <laughs> it's just me at the minute, right? But <laughs> um, yeah, I, I can see the appeal of, of what you're saying there. So um, in, the, in that decision making process, then you mentioned you were looking at different um, kind of uh, web, web development or web building type um, franchises. Were there many to choose from, or was there just one or two? And kind of, I found what, what... three that I seriously considered. Um, one of them was a far bigger corporate American one, um, and I think that I had the feeling that I'd end up feeling like I had a job, and it was almost it almost felt like going back to ICL, so round peg in a square hole. Um, so got rid of that one, and then there's another one. Um, and I think this is, you know, where you want to do your due diligence. Um, I realised that the territories were far smaller, um, that the, um, the franchisees themselves were theoretically doing the design work, and I'm not a graphic designer. Um, so, yeah, it was fairly obvious in the end which of the three I was going to go for. Um, but it is definitely worth talking to a, a few franchisees um, and having a look at the, the scope for business development, because I don't think I would be as happy as I am now if I'd just gone down, you know, either of those other routes. Yeah, I guess I guess for some people they might like that corporate environment. Um, in fact, they do like to have, you know, it almost be pigeonholed, not pigeonholed, but you know, um, kind of shown the exact path and be part of this larger organisation. Um, but I guess if you're a bit more entrepreneurial, which I've, I get the feeling you are, you know, you want to be able to have a, a little bit more free reign and having a broader territory, I guess, helps with that. Right. Um, I, yeah, I guess for some people it might be overwhelming to have, uh, you know, a large territory. So, um, what's, what's the size of your territory and, and, and why do you prefer that size? Do you think? Oh, goodness. Um, I cover... The majority of Bristol and North Somerset, but when I was looking at this other franchise, um, the, the person who already was working with the franchise basically had little more than Western Supermare. And to be honest, I don't think it was enough to actually find enough clients to make the, the business viable. Um, right. So for, for me, um, it was actually making sure that I had a large enough territory to be able to make sufficient sales to making the business viable. And I thought that their territories just weren't big enough. So I, no, I don't think really that what I had was overly um, scary in terms of the size of it. I thought it was probably about right. Um, Yeah, the other one was just too small. You, you would yeah. never actually have made a viable business out of it. And it was trying to work out what was a viable business as well. Fantastic. And and in terms of um, that decision-making process, so you, you talk about due diligence there. Um, who, who was involved? Were your, your family involved in those decisions? Um, you, you, and, and kind of what was your process? Did you kind of have like a, a set process? Because by that point, you're you kind of experienced the buying franchises, right? You'd already bought one, so you now to make it successful. So 
did you have like a set structure to follow? Do you know what? I can't remember. Um, what did <laughs> I do? Um, so things like having a look into the directors at, um, at head office, um, make sure you know, have a look, see whether there are any bankruptcies filed against them. Talking to head office, um, Googling the other franchisees. I went down for a discovery day at head office um, and spoke to other franchisees. So I think that there's looking at what you can find um, sort of in the global domain out there on people's websites and having a look at that, talking to the franchisors themselves, talking to franchisees, um, and also then checking out the directors of the franchise that you're looking at going to to work with um and asking you know if it's important to you how much you turn over actually asking realistically what is it that the top franchisees are turning over yeah yeah do, do you um do you feel that kind of was achievable so what some of the top franchisees were, were earning at that point because i've spoken to people in the past who kind of look at um franchise brands and go yeah well the ones at the top it's just not really achievable for most people they've just got lucky or they're they're some sort of superhuman <laughs> um that's an interesting question so um it was a fairly young franchise and there we were given a, a spreadsheet with Oh, and this is what you could earn if. And I have to say that I took that with a pinch of salt. There were other franchisees already in place. There weren't a huge number of them. But yes, I absolutely believed that I could be earning what they earned. Um, so, yes, I did. Um, and I, I have to say, with most franchisees, you know, they occasionally people are in the right place at the right time but it's funny the harder that you work the luckier you seem to get <laughs> yeah I, li I like that saying it? It, <laughs> it's completely true isn't it, it is absolutely true. absolutely um and and i think that if it isn't working looking at why it isn't working rather than just i i think early on in my journey at one point i was frustrated it wasn't going as quickly as i wanted it to um and it's very easy to say, well, this isn't fair and that isn't fair and I blame this. Whereas I think that you actually need to turn it back on yourself and say, right, what could I be doing differently? It's all well and good uh, saying, oh, well, this isn't working because and that's not fair. But actually turning around, taking taking back the power and making decisions about what you can do to change things going forward. Uh, yeah, is really what makes the difference. Yeah, I agree totally. But um, I'm wondering, what, what were you looking for from the franchise or in that decision making process? What did you want to see from them uh, to make you feel comfortable in making that decision? Well, for me at the time, um, as I said, I'm taking it's coming back quite a, a, a lot. This is quite a long time ago now. Thinking about it, when um, I had images, there was a a winter where it was um, very snowy. And so there was quite a lot of time where I couldn't get my trailer out to schools because they were shut and I missed quite a lot of work and things were very tough financially. So one of the things that I wanted was um, some sort of recurring income so that even though um, I was self-employed. I knew that there was a certain amount that was going to hit, hit the bank account every month. So if I was ill or um, if for some reason I couldn't work, that there was this recurring income and that I could continue to work. So for me, that was a big thing. Um, I liked the fact that none of the directors um, had ever, ever gone to prison or been declared bankrupt. That was a fairly positive run <laughs> for me. Um, and I also like the fact that um, the franchisee, the majority of the franchisees that I spoke to were very positive. Um, and one thing that I did do, um, I was sort of given a list of these are the franchisees that you need to speak to. And funnily enough, they give you the one or two top performing ones. I would always say, Google them, find some other franchisees and don't just talk to who the franchisor wants you to talk to. Speak to all of the franchisees or if there are hundreds of them, choose a decent cross section. 
Yeah, I, I'm going to add something to that in terms of advice, because I, I think for franchisees, if they're constantly bombarded by people from the outside, that can be quite frustrating as well, right? Because you've got a job to do at the end of the day. Uh, so I would ask the franchisor, give me someone at the bottom, some at the top, someone in the midpoint. That, that'd be my, the way I would advise that. But um, I know... I know. Well, I don't think the franchisor should be doing that until they've got somebody that's virtually ready to sign on the dotted line. Yeah. Um, and to be honest, um, you know, certainly with my franchise now, franchise now, we're not looking at 50 people a month or anything. You know, oh, yeah. it, it's... Uh, and, and there are a lot of us now, so they could be picking people out of thin air. So I, I definitely think I'd choose one or two at random. But, yeah, I, I take your point. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's because I've sat franchise all side and, and, um, and, and been in that fr franchise recruitment part. You kind of think of it from both sides and, and things like that. But you're, you're, to be honest, if I'm buying a franchise, I might be doing what you suggested. If, <laughs> if I'm honest. Yeah, I... <laughs> Yeah, and it's it's not necessarily the you know you want to hear the good the bad and the ugly yeah um and actually listening to people that weren't so enamored of it actually trying to cut through what they didn't like and work out whether it was them not running a business properly or whether it was a flaw with the franchise model and that's why i think it is worth speaking to some people that are not as happy because then you will do listen and try and work out whether it, the issue is is that franchisee or the franchise model, because it's really not always the franchise model. Yeah, it's as much as it's a blueprint, you still have to um, to, to follow it, right, and do things Absolutely. in the right way and put the energy Absolutely. and time in. So you're not going to have a network f full of 100% successful, happy people, are you, at the end of the day? No. So you're right, it's good to get all viewpoints. But... Um, in terms of the training, then with um, it's easy. What was what was that actually like? Was oh, mind blowing. It... <laughs> um, it was so intensive. Um, yeah, so I think it was four days down at head office, and the amount I learnt just blew my brain. Um, and I, I learnt that information, um, and I think that I came back and probably spent four weeks just immersing myself in that information. Um, I am a bit of a control freak, and I didn't want to go out to a customer not knowing what I was talking about. Um, so I, yeah, I think I probably spent five weeks training myself, whereas they gave you four days. Um, and there were other people who left head office and I think had closed a deal within the first day or two, whereas I wasn't approaching a customer until I knew exactly what I was doing. Yeah. And that's 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 interesting. Everyone's got their different approaches, and um, I, I think most people would want to come out of training and go right. Let's go get a client and and their money. So, yeah, you're definitely taking a, a bit of a different approach there. But I I also understand it because, uh, yeah, in business development, I've made some mistakes where you know <laughs> you go flying out the gates and then go, uh, yeah, I don't know the answer to that one and. <laughs> Yeah. Funny enough, further down the line, I've actually realised that me being such a control freak hasn't always helped me, and in some ways, it's actually held me back. Um, so, you know, I talked about um, being very in control and being very risk averse, um, and as I went further and further down my franchise journey, I actually realised that that was holding me back in the end. Oh, really? Mm. What, what, why do you think that? Or what, is there any sort of scenarios you can give us? Yeah, well, yeah, I, I guess I can give you one exactly. So I, I ended up getting coached about three years ago um, because I thought it would be interesting just to talk to them. Um, and I definitely had enough work that it would be good if I could get somebody else to help me. But I think that I was very much of the belief that nobody could do it as well as I could. But um, as with... Uh, as with all businesses, you have to sell whatever it is you produce. Um, and I'm spending so much of my time doing a job within the business, I wasn't developing it. Um, and I was terrified of taking somebody on because they might not do it quite as well as I did. Um, and in the end, I, I did take, well, I, I now have two members of staff and a VA. And 
actually letting go of control and letting them take part of my business was for me it was huge and I felt very uncomfortable doing it but my business would never have expanded if I hadn't have accepted the fact that somebody could actually do bits of my job as well as I could yeah fantastic it's it's a funny it's um it's a story I've heard time and time again and um trying to implement into my business or my plans for my business at some point but I am starting to think I wouldn't give that part up because who else can think like I do and who else can write like I do, mm, you know, <laughs> systems and processes. <laughs> exactly. But were, were the it's easy franchise or happy with you taking on employees on, on oh, your they business? Were, they, they actually were actively encouraging it and they, they would like more franchisees to do that. Yeah. Okay. So do you think that's something that somebody could take on from day one is just start employing people or do you think they need to do, do the work first and then, then bring on employees? I, uh, so I think it would depend on the franchise, but the franchise that I'm in, I wouldn't have had the money to do it straight away. So I did need to build up some of that recurring income. Um, and that was then what started to pay for members of staff. Um, so no, I I think you'd have struggled to take it on, do it immediately, unless you had a huge budget. Um, so, no, I, you know, with hindsight, I should have done it four or five years earlier. I don't think I could have done it right at the outset. Yeah, that's fair enough. And so would you say you have a successful business now that, that you were hoping for? Yes, yes, I think I do. Um, yeah, so I have that um, recurring income um, and I have the flexibility that I want. So, yeah, I, I think I do have the, the job that I, well, the job, the business that I always wanted. Ah, oh, fantastic. And uh, what do you think has been the key to that success? What's helped you to get there? What's been the most important thing? Goodness. Um, not giving up when the going gets tough. So, um, yeah, picking yourself up and dusting yourself off. There will be days where you think, why on earth did I do this? Um, and then I think that also remembering that at the end of the day, that it's your customers who are paying your, your income. Um, and so, you know, for me, excellent customer service, along with, you know, positive mindset are probably the, the two things that, I think have got me to where I am at the moment. Yeah, customer centric approach is is definitely important, isn't totally. it? It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, so I'm thinking now, kind of from the 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 franchise or and the support. What's been the? I, I, and I'm asking this question because your business now is different. So from those early days, that training was fantastic, and and the, the kind of showing you how to run the business. But what's yeah. the most? What's the best thing the franchiser does for you now as an experienced franchisee? Runs all the bits of my business that I don't want to do. So, <laughs> um, they've got a finance function, so I'm not constantly chasing them for, uh, chasing people for money. Um, they provide the graphic designers, as I mentioned earlier, you know, I, I can get good spec out of people in terms of the design that they want, but I'm not a designer. And they've got other people that do um, the coding. So that leaves me to find customers, talk to them about their business, understand their business, help them with their content, we edit the websites for them and then support them on an ongoing basis. And we're freed up to do that because head office do their job really well. Yeah, that's cool. So they provide the products, right? And you, you're able to yes. to do everything else around that. And I'm sure that there are some franchises, some franchisors that also provide the customers, but that's really more way, not necessarily you're on your own, but that's the challenge that most franchisees have. Um, I, I think, well, and it's not just franchises, people get good at doing something and I think I'm going to turn this into a business. And whilst you might be very good at doing that thing, are you very good at also selling that thing? So I, I think the people need to remember that they will be selling whatever it is. Um, and, and that's really where the challenge lies. Yeah, I think that's the same for any franchise. Like you say, th there are a few that provide leads and so the sales support at the beginning um in particular but 
ultimately, I think if you're in any business, no matter what it is, you've got to be prepared to sell, right? Or market yourself. And, you know, and the, the, um, it's easy. Dad does give you sales training, but it's then up to you whether you want to take that on board and go and develop it and create a sales and marketing plan and so onwards or whether you sit there looking at the phone expecting it to ring because you don't like the idea of cold calling very much so it's those people that sort of you know grab the bull by the horns and go with it that will make a successful business fantastic so I'm, I'm going to move um, things on a little bit now to, um, well, actually, no, before I go into those three questions, there's one more I wanted to ask you. I, I wanted to find out um, for you, Susie, what is the future for your business? What's the next step? Oh, so the next step, um, I guess, I guess that, you know, it's two things. So there's one which is the next step on a personal level and there's another which is the next step on developing the business. So developing the business, um, I I would like to increase my turnover by another 50% in the next five years um, and ideally take on another member of staff. Um, and personally, um, it's about having the flexibility um, and my partner and I are looking at taking our businesses abroad um, and seeing whether we can run our businesses from abroad for a few weeks and then seeing where that takes us. Fantastic. Where, whereabouts abroad? So we're going to um, the Costa Blanca in Spain um, for a couple of months just to see how it works running the businesses from there. Um, and once we've done that, we will reevaluate and decide whether that's something we want to do on a long term basis. Wow, that's so exciting. You know, it, it, well, it conjures up images of, uh, you know, sitting by a pool with a cocktail, with a laptop, you know, and just yeah. <laughs> having a dip in between. I, like some work as well. <laughs> I, I know the reality is different, of course, but it, it sounds very exciting, doesn't it? I, so, I'm um, sure that there'll be a couple of cocktails and sitting by the pool involved. I'm sure there will be at some point, yes. Is there a worry, though, that, you know, what what are the staff going to be doing in the meantime? You know, you, you mentioned you had two staff and, and what are the clients going to think of that? Is there, is there ever that worry there at all? Or is it the, the business model as it is? Do you think it so doesn't I matter? Think the business model as it is should work. Um, I, when I took my first member of staff on, it was actually um, at the start of COVID and I didn't meet her face to face for a year. Wow. So the fact that I managed to train her and get her up and running, and she is absolutely amazing. She's absolutely brilliant. Um, and she really got up and running um, with all of her training online. Um, and I think that if you have proper KPIs for your staff and you actually then look at those and make sure that they're hitting those, that, that it shouldn't be a problem. So, no, my staff know what they've got to do. Um, I don't see very many people face to face anyway, and that's one of the reasons that I got a salesperson in is so that if there is need to see somebody face to face, I have that person in Bristol. I will always be coming backwards and forwards anyway. You know, I, I've got university aged children here. Um, you know, Bristol is my home, so even if we spent more time abroad, I would always be coming back. Um, and I think, to be honest, most of my customers don't know whether I'm sat in Bristol or the other side of the world anyway. So, no, I think if you set the business up to run properly while you're away, um, and if you worried about all of those things too much, you would never do anything. I mean, so if we go abroad and after two weeks it's really not working and it's a complete disaster, we come home. It's, I, I, I just think that if you don't just go for it, and see if something works. And um, don't get me wrong, since I've um, taken staff on, I've had a huge disaster as well. And a few years ago, that would have just stopped me from ever recruiting anybody again. Whereas, you know, I, you make a mistake, you dust yourself down, you pick yourself up and you get back on with it. Yep, learn from it and, and go from there. But I think... Um... I think what you're doing with going abroad is pushing that flexibility, right? Seeing how flexible you can make it, which is cool. Absolutely. And, and, Absolutely. and I've got every confidence you're going to make a success of it just because of the, the, the things that you said are important to you. And that's the customer centric part of it. And 
I've seen a lot of other franchisees in, in, in the brand I used to work with go and live abroad for six months of the year and, and be absolutely fine, you know, turning over hundreds of thousands with large name clients and it's no issue yeah. in the true at all. So, and um, I think as long as you plan in advance, so, I mean, for me, um, one of the bits of having that flexibility was thinking, well, what could go wrong? Um, well, I don't want somebody phoning me and hearing um, a foreign ringtone. Um, so it's doing things like getting decent phone systems in place. Um, at the moment, I'm not entirely convinced that where we're going has got um, a good enough Wi-Fi connection. So once we get over that, I've got all of my options. So if I try it out and it doesn't work, the next day I can go and buy that. So, yeah, doing some contingent. You can't just wing it and completely hope for the best. You do need to think what could go wrong um, or what might not work and try and plan for it before you go. But in the end, you won't plan for everything. And, yeah, you just just need to do it yeah no that's cool and have, have it's easy been supporting you the head office team yes so um i have told a couple of them and they they seem to be fine with it i think to be honest as long as i prove that i can run my business from there i think to be honest they actually quite like the idea because they want more people to get staff so actually I think that me doing that, they're sort of looking at it and thinking, well, this, this might convince other franchisees that staff's a good idea. I, I think it's a good idea to get staff and, and build the business you want. You don't always have to be the, the, you know, the person delivering all elements of it all the time. Um, everyone's got skill sets that suit them better. And so, yeah, why not? Once you've got it up and running, treat Absolutely. it like any other business. And when I did go on holiday this year, I did have... I, that was not going to be a holiday, it's working abroad. But when I did go on holiday this year to Turkey, um, they did have my number in case there was an emergency, but I didn't look at my emails for 10 days and I had a proper break. Whereas for the first six years or so that I ran this business, every time I went on holiday, I checked my emails twice a day. Fantastic. So... Thank you very much for sh for sharing that, and it's I think it's an interesting journey that you've had, and uh, so it sounds like you've been well supported, and it, it it's just a good match, right? At the end of the day, it might not be for everybody, you know, somebody else might not find it works for them, but it sounds like a good match. But um, I, w I wanted to find out. Um, uh, I normally ask um, everybody, and I know you might not have an answer to this one, but um, do you have any funny, strange, or weird stories that you're happy to share you know what? in your career? <laughs> I suppose, actually, I, I have thought of one. I went to a, a networking event. Um, it was an Institute of Directors networking event. And, and just before I was about to go, I saw somebody from the other side of the room, a, 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 somebody called Steve Sliney, and I, I thought, I know him. So I thought, I'm going to go over and say hello. So um, as I was on my way out, I sort of interrupted and I sort of touched Steve on the um, shoulder and said, hi, you know, I, I don't know whether you remember me. And he looked at me and said, yeah, yeah. He said, I, I recognise you, but I can't work out quite who you are. I said, was I at school with you? And I said, sort of. And he went, oh, Miss Price. And I was his maths teacher when he was in year 11. <laughs> Fantastic. So funny enough, he still calls me this price, even though he knows that my name's Susie Perry now. <laughs> oh, excellent. I don't think you're ever going to stop that because um, my mum used to be um, like a nursery school teacher and it was always, yeah, Mrs. Purnell or, uh, or whatever it was for years. Even now, my, my, my friends still call her that. So, uh, yeah, it's funny. But... but the bizarre thing is I've never got people in their 40s who I used to teach. So I was like, oh, my God, that just makes me so old. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Um, excellent. So next question is, what's been the, the proudest or most inspiring moment in your career? I think actually realizing that I was a good boss um, and that I was providing good quality jobs for other people. Um, I, I got feedback from two of my staff um, and one in particular, we, we sort of did a big feedback um, and it, it, I think it sort of turned into a bit of a therapy session and just realizing that I had managed to make a difference in somebody else's life in a very, very real way. Um, 
yeah, I, you know, I'm really proud of all the great websites that I do, but, you know, my staff knowing that they're happy and they come to work loving what they do just gives me a huge sense of achievement. Yeah, that's cool. And it's a, kind of a little, little bonus, really, wasn't what you was expecting at the beginning. You're looking for that flexibility. And, no, it, it wasn't at all. But I, I think there has to be some why about it. And, and I think that, you know, the why also, um, I thought about my why quite early on. Um, my kids... Uh, so I was a, a single mum not long after I started this, and I remember my kids sometimes saying to me, oh, mum, you know, why can't you pick us up from school more, and it's not fair, why don't we go on, uh, you know, more of these uh, lovely holidays that my friends go on? And in the end, I sort of sat down and I said to them, you know, look, everything's a balance. Either I can give up work altogether, and I will be there to pick you up every single day, but there won't be holidays, etc. We can stay as we are. It's a balance. You know, we do get to go away at times. Okay, you know, we're not going to the Caribbean or anything, but, you know, we get quality time together, and I get to pick you up a bit. Or I can go back to my corporate job, and we can have holidays in the Caribbean a couple of times a year, but I will never pick you up for school. You know, which do you want? Um, and they said, oh, actually, what you're doing now, which is just as well, because I was, it didn't say that either of the others, I don't know what I'd have done. <coughs> um, so, yeah, it, you know, it, it was about making compromises. Um, and, yeah, quality of life was really important. And my why, really, I think, they, was then my children. And as they got older, um, I, you know, I hope that I gave them roots and wings. They're now happy. At university, and and now I can sort of find my way through other things in the business. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, maybe it's your new um, your new students or children that are coming through as your employees now instead. Yeah, maybe, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'll try and wrap everything up in a nice kind of like finished package. But <laughs> sorry, I left you too many loose strings. <laughs> No, no, it's all good. But um, the, the the final question I have then for you is, um, okay, we've got, we've we've kind of pulled out some bits of advice already. But what would be the the most important piece of advice you'd give to anybody who's looking at investing a franchise, uh, whether it's it's easy or any others? What would be the the one most important thing you'd like to share with them as advice? Um. So this goes back to very, very early days, and it's do your sums and make sure that you can afford to live um, because you don't want to invest all of this money into a franchise. Um, they take a while to take off. You're not going to have an income from day one. So make sure that all of the money you put into it isn't in the franchise and you've left yourself with nothing. So it's, yeah, do the right financial planning um, because I think if anything, it's been – well, seeing people fail, it's been because they haven't had enough money coming in quick enough. And you'll get there in the end. But be realistic um, and make sure that, you know, and if you're looking at more expensive franchises and less expensive ones, work out what you're going to live on for the first six months. And don't just throw all of your money at the franchise unless for some reason you can guarantee you're going to have an income from day one. Do you think six months is a long enough period of time to let's say, have some savings for? I've heard some people I say you. it depends on the franchise. Um, I, I mean, if, if, for example, you, you know, you're looking at something like McDonald's, the chances are that you're going to have somebody come in on day one. Um, if it's something like um, it's easy, yeah, you, you're going to have some sort of income, even though it wouldn't be a full-time income by the time you get to the end of six months so i think be realistic do your financial forecast work out what it is you need to live off of um and, and i think that really will genuinely change depending on the franchise that you're going for yeah i, I, I think that's um a good uh, good advice so let's say it was it's easy yes have that savings for six months maybe but if you get some income in the first month like that person you mentioned after the training at least that income then is meaning your six months is stretching out to seven months or Absolutely. Absolutely. And then it becomes more manageable. So yeah, well, that's really cool. Well, 
Susie, thank you so much for um, for that. Really good advice. And thank you so much for your time and for, for sharing your story with us. It really is very appreciated. And I've had a good time chatting with you. Thank you, Ed. I've really enjoyed it too. Excellent. Take care now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.